member states' commitments were embodied in the resolution adopted at the recent World Health Assembly. I urge you to offer all your support. Illness. Frustration. Shocking. A fundamental human right. Dignity. It has to be dignity. Leaving no one behind. If you cannot ensure a good quality of care at the healthcare facility, where else? The resolution is approved. Transformation. Cornerstone. It's a fundamental building block. Compassion. Hope. Life. Healing. Indispensable risk. <clears throat> Member States' commitments were embodied in the resolution adopted at the recent World Health Assembly. I urge you to offer all your support. Illness. Frustration. Shocking. A fundamental human right. Dignity. It has to be dignity. Leaving no one behind. If you cannot ensure a good quality of care at the healthcare facility, where else? The resolution is approved. Transformation. Cornerstone. It's a fundamental building block. Compassion. Hope, life, healing, indispensable respect. It's the future. It should be something so basic and so integrated in our healthcare facilities. And that's a, a social justice issue for populations across the world. Dear participants, hello, my name is uh, Maria Neira and I'm the director of the Department of uh, Public Health and Environment at the World Health and, uh, Organization. 
very happy to be moderating this uh, very exciting uh, uh, webinar. Uh, 52 weeks ago, we were all celebrating the approval of a monumental resolution on WASH at the healthcare facility. The environment was really very exciting at that time. Many of you participating today, today, you were participating one year ago to this very exciting moment. We have a very good side event with a lot of commitments, engagement, and everybody decided to go and make progress. Today, one year later, we are confronted with uh, uh, fighting a pandemic that in the middle between last year and this year is uh, putting us in front of our weaknesses. Everybody is now trying to respond to this pandemic. And I think what we can see is that uh, our work, our resolution, our decision to have sustainable wash services in healthcare facilities is more relevant than ever. Uh, the meeting today, the webinar today is about the progress we made since one year ago, but the progress we will be making and how we accelerate that project, that process, and uh, how we engage other partners, how those partners accelerate as well on their engagement, and how we make sure that we, at the healthcare facility, which is the, the, the basic place where we need to have all of those services, those services are functioning. I'm sure you are all committed, you are all engaged, but the purpose of this webinar will be making sure that all together we will certainly make more progress, more impact, and hopefully in one year from now where we will meeting at a real World Health Assembly, we will all be celebrating this progress. As I mentioned, uh, this is the uh, first time that we have this virtual meeting instead of having it at the World Health Assembly. And therefore, let me pass now the, the micro to uh, Maggie Montgomery. She will share with us some uh, arrangements and some logistics before we start uh, this very exciting webinar. Maggie, over to you. Perfect. Thank you, Maria, and welcome, everyone. I just want to make three quick announcements. The first is, as Maria said, normally this would be at the World Health Assembly and we would have a much smaller number of people. And so today we're really happy that we're actually able to open this up to many more of you. But I just want to remind you, we are following the traditional side event format, so there won't be time for lots of open Q&A. Um, but that brings me to my second point, is that we do have a platform where we have six very specific moderated discussions that all fit around the broader work that WHO and UNICEF are doing on WASH and healthcare facilities, ranging from commitments to health workforce to monitoring standards. So I encourage you, if you have specific conversations or questions or information that you want to pose, that those will be open um, during this meeting today. And the last is what's next. So importantly, all the slides, the recording, all the materials will be on the WASH and healthcare facility site. So you can visit that to look up um, anything and to share with others. But secondly, this is part of a much wider and broader piece of work. And we will be following up on several of these threads um, through our upcoming global documents, through our task teams, and through future events. So if you're new to this discussion, we hope that you will find it um, engaging and, and, and want to continue to contribute. And if you're not new, um, we thank you for joining us again and, and hope that we can continue to evolve and, and progress on this important work. So that's it. Over to you, Maria. Thanks. Thank you very much, Maggie. And uh, as I say, I am very excited to be your moderator for this first uh, session, but it's as well something extremely challenging because I'm supposed to accommodate in, our, in one hour presentations from people who I'm sure that will be uh, contributing enormously. So I will be a tough moderator, even if it's virtual and I don't have any physical power to really impose that on you, uh, but I have the microphone so I can mute. Let me start uh, uh, welcoming a very good old friend and uh, somebody that you see every, every day on television, <laughs> almost every day on television, the most famous guy uh, these times, and uh, the one who is driving us on the very good road to fight this pandemic. Dr. Mike Ryan, over to you. Hi, everybody, and uh, thanks, Maria. I would hate to say how many years myself and Maria have been working Shut together. Up. <laughs> <laughs> Shut Maria, up. <laughs> uh, 
and uh, but we did start out on the road of cholera together many many years ago and uh, i learned a lot from maria about epidemic diarrheal diseases at that time um uh, i think uh, the current pandemic situation obviously is still a huge challenge we're approaching five million cases over three hundred thousand deaths and what's concerning within that is that the current seroprevalence studies show that probably somewhere between 1.5 and 20 percent of people have seroconverted almost all of the seroprevalence studies show uh, rates of less than 10 percent uh, even in areas of very very high transmission so it means we have a long way to go so the idea that we've passed through a first wave and everything is going to return to normal i think we need to really wake up smell the coffee uh, and realize internalize that we have a long way to go um, within that and as we move forward in ensuring uh, that we can adequately contain the disease we really do have to invest in infection prevention and control and as a baseline water and sanitation and hygiene services in healthcare facilities we have lost too many health workers uh, we've seen too many explosive uh, events in general hospital populations um, and uh, and obviously uh, not all of that is avoidable in the classic sense of the word at the beginning but as we know the risks are now when you know a risk and when you're aware uh, of your opportunity to stop then you start to become accountable for actually intervention uh, at the beginning of a pandemic it's difficult everyone's reacting everyone's trying to do their best everyone's struggling and we've seen some of the most sophisticated countries in the world struggle in the face of this event but now as we get ourselves more and more organized and as we move forward we have to address some of the issues that are underpinning uh, some of the the problems we face there is no question in my mind that the, this pandemic has exposed as the director general says the cracks and the gaps in our system uh, it's exposed preparedness it's exposed emergency response but it's also exposed our healthcare systems and some of the baseline services and some of the baseline protections that should be built into our health service at all times uh, and that in itself is playing itself out along a line of equity uh, in that uh, countries with weaker health systems with less money in the system uh, struggle to provide basic essential health services when you add in an epidemic disease into that you just amplify that lack of access to water that lack of access to hygiene it becomes a massive amplifier of inequity a massive visible scar uh, in the system and uh, it's something we we need to address a safe and quality health care for all has as it as its baseline water uh, sanitation we face the same issues in congo uh, over the last year and a half in, in ebola uh, i've seen in the two outbreaks there i remember doing a quick survey in one major city in equatorial congo we counted 99 health facilities in one large town and not a single one had running water in the middle of an ebola outbreak uh, very difficult to tell people to wash their hands uh, when there's no water <laughs> very difficult to disinfect uh, isolation facilities and triage facilities when there's no water so sometimes i think we may we try sometimes <clears throat> try to design very sophisticated solutions for what sometimes are very straightforward problems um, and water sanitation and hygiene within healthcare facilities is the basic prerequisite of quality healthcare and something we overlook all the time as we try to make yellow ribbons and build what we call healthcare infrastructure. Um, infrastructure is a great word. Infra means under. It means the foundation, the baseline. The infrastructure is not the walls and it's not the roof. It's what underpins the success and quality and equity of the system. That structure that lies beneath. Uh, and in that sense, I would see water sanitation and, hy and hygiene as the absolute underpinning of any form of effective or equitable healthcare. Uh, particularly now, as we look forward in this pandemic, some of the populations at greatest risk, refugees, migrants in camp situations, people in closed population settings, high density peri-urban environments. Um, we've seen it in migrant uh, dormitories uh, in, in Singapore and in other countries. Anywhere now where people gather together in an environment where there is limited access to water, sanitation and hygiene and physical, social capacity to not be overcrowded, shall we say, 
is probably one of the main driving forces of clusters and of major epidemics around the world right now. So we really do have to redouble our efforts. And I hope for all of the terrible things that have occurred because of COVID-19, it can act as, as a pointer, as a, as a new flag to wave to say, look, COVID-19 is doing nothing but exposing the inequities, the lack of investment, the lack of that infrastructure. And that we can't, I've been through too many of these with Maria, SARS and God knows what else. And every time we get to the end of these epidemics, we seem to get collective amnesia. We, we almost uh, forget what happened. And we get back on the same old horse and, 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 and just really don't deal with the fundamentals, the fundamental problems of the system. So I came along today to offer just whatever support I can. Uh, <clears throat> I drank the Kool-Aid many years ago. Maria indoctrinated me into the world of water and sanitation. So, uh, but I have seen it every single day of my life in the field and across so many epidemics. So I'm a believer too. So whatever we can do to work together, to partner on this, uh, you'll have a good partner in the emergencies program, Maria. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, he has keep referring her for how long and how many years we know each other, but we were extremely young, the two of us at that time. So whatever counting are you doing is wrong. Anyway, uh, yes, here we are in 2020, still fighting for the prerequisites for, for uh, the infrastructure of any healthcare facility, which is access to safe water and sanitation, but maybe COVID-19 will offer an opportunity if I can say that, to leave a good legacy after this and finally losing that bad memory that humans we have and we leave something behind in terms of water and sanitation, soap and hygiene for everybody. But I have many uh, relevant, important people here and the next one will be another good friend, Sanjay uh, from UNICEF. Sanjay, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Um, <clears throat> I hope you can uh, hear me well. Yes, Sanjay, yeah. very well. Okay, Ex excellent. Um, I'm just uh, going to struggle with the technology a little bit here, but uh, it's wonderful um, uh, to be amongst, um, uh, amongst friends. Um, uh, and and uh, thank you so much, for Maria, for, for um, inviting me. And, and uh, great to, to have this uh, opportunity to work together again on this, on this uh, uh, event um, and, and on this agenda, which of course to us is not new because we um, were working on it, but uh, still clearly a, a, long, a long way to, to, to go. And um, I think the COVID-19 has, has brought the unprecedented challenges um, uh, to our work and, and continues to take its toll um, across all countries and um, has really had a devastating impact, not just on health systems, but on entire economies. And we haven't seen anything like this um, in the 75 years of the, of the UN's existence, not as, as, as you know, I, that I've lived through all of those 75 years, but uh, perhaps more than ever before, it has highlighted, as, as, as uh, um, Dr. Ryan mentioned, it, it really has highlighted the, the uh, the kind of poverty inequalities, but also the, the fundamental weaknesses in our um, primary health care systems and, and systems overall. Um, and, and what it also has reinforced is the importance um, of hand hygiene, um, disinfection and cleaning. And I think, uh, if, if, if again, looking at the glass half full part of this, um, it has actually provided us with a once in a generation opportunity to reinforce this really important norm um, of hand hygiene, hand washing with soap. Um, that is so critical to disrupting the transmission of um, so many diseases, um, not just COVID. And, and if um, this uh, sad um, and, and tragic um, events leads to um, a real social norm change um, in, in hand washing with soap and hand hygiene. Um, I think um, at least some, some good would have, uh, would have come um, of this. So central to this effort is that all healthcare facilities must um, be equipped with, with wash services, which is the agenda um, that we have uh, um, ahead of us. And the current state of uh, facilities, is, as, as we know from the data we have 
means that we have a long way to go. So globally, um, one in six healthcare facilities has no um, hygiene services, meaning they lack hand hygiene facilities at points of, of care, um, as well as soap and water at toilets. And this puts children, newborns, and their mothers at increased risk of uh, not just COVID-19, but uh, many um, infectious uh, diseases. And without bold and decisive action, um, we, uh, we will not be able to either defeat this virus nor make the progress we want to make on maternal newborn um, um, child health. So um, certainly for us at UNICEF, this is one of our core priorities and uh, and, and improving washing healthcare facilities is critical. And we're making sure that, uh, that, that healthcare facilities have adequate supplies of the products and services they need to, to continue with uh, um, the, the kind of infection prevention and control the cleaning and disinfection, um, um, as well as the, uh, the, the uh, capacities to for good hand hygiene and and uh, working closely with governments and yourselves many of the partners here um, to provide the kind of assistance that is needed the data collection and so on is part of uh, um, our COVID-19 um, response um, can you still hear me um, Maria yeah, we can hear you, but okay. uh, I was taking advantage to invite you as well to uh, maybe summarize a little bit and finish because we... Okay, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I am not, I don't have very long to go. Um, so what, one of the areas that we're working on is an investment case for washing healthcare facilities um, to estimate costs to, uh, and the financial needs and the funding um, that is currently um, available. But as the Secretary General mentioned, um, I, I think it's important to build back better. And this um, is a key area of our programming that will make sure um, that we come back and bounce back stronger and are resilient um, going forward. So my key message is, of course, UNICEF, we're a partner, a key partner in this. We want to work with you. And uh, it is by working together that uh, we will make sure that we bounce back and recover from this pandemic um, and reimagine a better future for our children and everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Maria. Thank you so much, uh, Sanjay. Talking about recovery, can I invite uh, the World Bank, uh, Jennifer Sara? Um, yes, good morning, Maria. It's great to see you again. Um, and hello, Sanjay, Maria. We were last year Latinos in Costa Rica, you must remember. And we were actually saying a huge commitment. Let's move this agenda forward. A year later, I don't know how much progress we made, and I think now the big uh, change is really how do we go from commitment to action. Uh, my colleague Mohammed, I think he's also on the line. He's the director of health at the World Bank, um, but he's really been leading our COVID response on the emergency side. And from the water and sanitation side, we've really tried to work together. And I think that's what's been great is in the we now have a hundred uh, emergency response uh, operations but we've tried very, very hard to put a wash and healthcare facilities component into each one of them. And we've learned um, some, some important lessons. First of all, how the partnership of working across sectors is challenging. It's challenging even though we have the highest level commitment at the World Bank to do this within our own teams, but more importantly is at the country level, is how do we use this opportunity? And we've learned that we need not just the healthcare facilities um, in the water and health sector ministries, but also the water staff to work together. Because it's not just putting in the infrastructure, um, it's not just putting the, the facility, uh, building uh, water and sanitation facilities into every healthcare facility, it's ensuring the continuity of the supply to make sure that the services are being effectively used and sustained. And so this is why we're starting with an emergency response but thinking of a much, much longer term agenda of using the emergency, but looking at sustainable service deliveries. How do we finance uh, water and sanitation services to all healthcare facilities going forward? So half of our operations now have a small, very small component for an emergency response um, to look at hand washing facilities, but we really need to take this as an entry point to look for longer term uh, full coverage. Um, let me, I think Maria Mohammed is also here. Is he? 
also online? Yes, I am. Um, well, then, yeah, there you are. Okay, so let me hand it over to you. Um, Thank you, Jennifer. One minute, Mohammed. Hi. Yes, hi, Maria. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Very good. No, thank you. I think uh, Jennifer laid it out. Uh, during these unprecedented times, it is even more clear how WASH is fundamental to the prevention and control of infections, but also to improving health outcomes in the context of even the agenda that we've been pursuing of universal health coverage. As Jennifer mentioned, the Fast Track facility has really created a unique opportunity for us to work even closer together to ensure that WASH is embedded within the context of our interventions uh, here and now, and to do so at scale. Clearly, we need to do more, and this is the path. This is an entry point that we have now, and we should build on it. So really looking forward to building on this agenda as we go forward post-COVID-19. Uh, so thank you. Thanks, Mohamed and the World Bank. Uh, you all see that I'm not giving titles on the introduction to save time, but you have it on your screen, the credential of these uh, very eminent people that is taking the floor. I'm calling them by their name, but uh, the, you, you can see the credentials. Thank you so much, World Bank. Let me move to the European Investment Bank. Uh, Dana, can you please take the floor? Dana, are you there? I am here, but my video was uh, cut off by the organizer. So <laughs> if you can hear me, I can go ahead. We can it's hear you very clearly, Dana. Please go ahead. OK. Um, I represent a very young initiative, the one uh, that is uh, between the WHO and the European Investment Bank. As the name says it, it's main, my institution is mainly an investment bank. But recently, investing in social sector has become more and more critical for everybody, including ourselves as the European Union Bank. Um, I will just briefly introduce uh, this recent initiative uh, where we try to partnership the WHO technical expertise with our financing structuring capabilities. It is by now a well-known fact that primary health care is a corner store of advancing towards universal health coverage. And the COVID-19 pandemics, like previous Ebola and SARS epidemics, has further crystallized the importance of these strong health systems for the population's health, as well as for the social and economic development. It's in this context that WHO and the IB are uh, starting their collaboration, trying to provide a comprehensive package of funding and associated technical assistance to low and middle income countries. This package intends to support immediate COVID-19 response, but at the same time to build resilient health systems to address health emergencies and accelerate progress towards uh, implementing PHC strategies and plans. The partnership will include with priority support to investments in health workforce, infrastructure, and last but not least, water hygiene and sanitation. That's where we are the newcomers and the young ones at the table. And uh, as you see, my credentials are nothing like the previous uh, speakers. So <laughs> it proves that we're still young in the process. This package um, will be deployed uh, at the country's level. Uh, after in, and we plan to work at the country level with regional offices, with uh, country offices and uh, of course with the countries uh, in question, starting with the WHO regions of Africa and uh, Mediterranean. Um, I look forward to hear back from the participants today because your diverse experiences and expertise will be critical for us to improve this joint WHO EIB initiative. And uh, we're, uh, willing to start learning very quickly in order to fill the gaps if and when necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dana. And uh, to finalize this first session of welcoming and uh, opening remarks, I have uh, uh, from Sida Andersen. Please, Asa, you have the floor. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much, WHO and UNICEF and Water Aid for arranging this seminar and inviting us. 
It is indeed a privilege to be able to send a short message from SIDA in Stockholm to literally all parts of the world and urge us all to recall, regroup and react when we recognize today the Washington Healthcare Facilities Resolution, as well as all the work and resources that have been dedicated to move this agenda forward. But as many, many, as everyone has said already, we need to maintain the momentum and we need to strengthen each other to further this work. So in regards to Washington healthcare facilities, uh, you know, there was a crisis already before the COVID-19 pandemic, but we now need to seize this heightened crisis to intensify actions. Sweden has, together with uh, more than 60 states and other actors, joined a statement for prioritization of water, sanitation and hygiene in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and longer term recovery. It backed by our strong political commitment and flexibility, so CIDA is able to take the most efficient and constructive actions um, Uh, to, to um, contribute to combat the pandemic and its consequences and advanced long-term work. So we are both reprogramming and making new allocations in our humanitarian interventions, as well as our development cooperation um, long-term uh, programs with an emphasis on building back better. And the focus on hand washing and emergency water and sanitation interventions are welcome openings, but we need to also to assure to think that these interventions uh, towards functioning and sustainable uh, systems. So CEDA has for the past year continued to intensify our emphasis on bridging the work between uh, the wash and health sector. We are working to clarify what our wash colleagues can do to strengthen our uh, health interventions what needs to be done in the intersection between the sectors and how the health sector can push the wash sector further. And we know that um, without fulfilling this crucial gap of safe wash in our health systems, no health investments or actions are as effective as they could and should be. And we also know that wash is a key to combat antimicrobial resistance, which is another of our priorities. So to conclude, I'd like to echo this year's resolutions, urging all of us to raise the profile of safe wash through our health strategies and funding mechanisms as part of our efforts to support strong and resilient health systems today, but also for the future. We've eradicated malignant applications before, so let us continue to work to assure safe water, sanitation and hygiene in all settings and once for all eradicate this deficit. I'm thanking you and wishing you all success with this webinar. Thank you so much, Asa. This was really very inspiring. Um, as a moderator, I'm not doing a good work at all because we are already late and we just started, but it's so important what we are saying. Uh, now I will be co-moderating this session with, uh, again, an, another very good friend, Kelly uh, from UNICEF. And um, we will start with a presentation. My suggestion, Kelly, is that we will try to save time from this technical presentation because I have the impression that most of the data uh, and the facts that uh, we will be presenting, uh, people has already mentioned some of them and they might be aware in other ways they can maybe uh, look uh, later on in more detail to the presentation. So with your permission, I will start and then Kelly will uh, make uh, as well uh, part of this presentation. It will be a joint WHO UNICEF. Uh, Kelly, I will start and then I will pass over to you. Thank you. If I can have my presentation, please. Okay, um, well, we are here together exactly for that, to achieve sustainable washing healthcare, and then at the same time responding to this emergency of addressing COVID-19 and safe quality care for all. Next one, please. Uh, what is quality? Uh, quality can be an empty promise without basic services. and. Uh, just to remind you some of the terrible figures, 8.6 million deaths per year in the low and middle income countries due to inadequate access to uh, quality care, 
millions still don't have access to health systems, five million people who were looking for care, but in fact they got very poor quality care, and up to one million mothers and newborns, which is dramatic, die from preventable infections linked to uh, unclean birds. Next one. So this is uh, one of, uh, I mean, our favorite mantra, do not call it a healthcare facility if, if there is no wash. And this is uh, how can we accept that today in 2020, we still have one in four uh, healthcare facilities lack basic water, one in five, no sanitation, 42% lack hand hygiene at point of care, and 40% lack systems to segregate uh, waste. So I think it gives you the, 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 the urgency of what we are discussing here. We look at that uh, six countries and only half of delivery rooms in those six countries will have all basic wash and infection prevention and control supplies. And you can see on your right what we call those basic wash and infection prevention and control supplies. Next one, please. Uh, of course, more than ever, uh, COVID-19 is putting us in front of our weaknesses on the healthcare facilities, on our health systems. There is no way to control any infectious disease, and particularly this one that is transmitted, uh, a respiratory disease, without having wash. So we need to make sure that at the UN White Plan, 6.7 billion USD that was prepared by WHO, one of the key components is that support access to safe water sanitation and hygiene and infection prevention and control in all settings, including the humanitarian and in particular in healthcare facilities. Of course, it was mentioned as well at the World Health Assembly resolution, the virtual one that just finished one day ago on COVID. And it's a, a critical part as well is, is, a, is a pillar in different parts of the WHO strategic response plan. The next one, please. So you have uh, uh, available, and nobody can say that there is not enough uh, scientific evidence. There are key documents on washing healthcare facilities and COVID-19, uh, COVID-19 technical note, WHO hand hygiene recommendations and COVID-19, washing healthcare baseline, baseline report and practical actions. I think all documents, evidence, is there and uh, there are no excuses why ac more action is not taken. We cannot use that excuse in, in any case. Next one, please. Uh, main messages for WASH in healthcare facilities in the context of uh, COVID-19. Very basic, the, the, the real infrastructure means that what is the basis for, for healthcare? Hand hygiene, uh, all healthcare facilities and public areas should have hand hygiene facilities. This is one of the things maybe uh, will be one of the good lessons after COVID. The importance of reinforcing as well the environmental hygiene, the effective uh, inactivation of the surface, which is very easy. In fact, it can be used in one minute with very simple uh, disinfectants. Uh, water sanitation and waste, uh, the, the, there is a WHO existing guidance and on the safe management and we are using that. This infection is important and effective. We need to look as well at the, the wash investment and action and needs to be included in all of those strategies for nest uh, investments because if all the investments were, will go again for infrastructures of healthcare facilities without looking at the basic requirements like wash, it will be a terrible mistake. And that's why we call it the no regrets investments. No matter what we will have uh, in the future, other pandemics or not, this is a good investment that will provide enormous benefit to protect uh, people's health. Wash service providers, uh, water and sanitation utility workers, they need to be recognized as uh, essential people. No, sometimes they, 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 they don't have a proper protection, they, they don't have the ability to work to work and hand hygiene uh, at home and work is difficult to have access as well. So they need to get a, a very important recognition for the critical role they are doing. Next one, please. So in WHO and UNICEF and other partners, critical partners, we are launching this global initiative on hand hygiene. That will be in June. 
And hopefully uh, all of these objectives, which are scaling up the universal hand hygiene and particularly or including in healthcare facilities, but uh, there will be based on WHO recommendations, which call for ability, availability of hand hygiene facilities. We want that in front of all public buildings, including schools and healthcare facilities and transport locations. I think that will be a good thing, not only for COVID, but for many other infectious diseases. Correct and frequent use of facilities, uh, systematically encouraged uh, for all and uh, aiming at uh, some uh, behavioral change as well, and installation and supervision responsibility of public health authorities. We need to look at, as well at the issue of maintenance. Next one, please. Of course, again, uh, we have uh, several, many documents that we can use where we have all the evidence base, the numbers, the strategies, the steps, all that is needed for washing healthcare facilities standards and tools and if you are not yet aware you you have here uh, the, the the website where you can find it all of those documents have been done with a lot of collaboration and are available to everyone uh, so we are encouraging all of you to please disseminate and make sure that in any healthcare facility any government any decision uh, the deci uh, decision makers that uh, will be deciding on investment, they have all of those documents. Next one. Practical step, uh, steps for improving and sustaining services. This is uh, just a distillation of what works in 30 countries. We have several recommendations. You can see all of them conduct a situation analysis, preparing. I mean, you have all of those steps that I, I don't need to describe right now but uh, you can go yeah you can go and, uh, and 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 check in all of those documents those are very practical steps that will give you uh, a very simple way how to move from there and now it is my pleasure to pass over to kelly to give you the most strategic part of the presentation kelly over to you Great, Maria. Thank, thank you so much. And it's such a huge uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I think just as, um, as Mike Ryan started out, he said, you know, the healthcare, um, this work on WASH is so fundamental um, to public health and also what I always like to call healthy healthcare facilities. Um, I think, you know, this is a problem, as Maria said, that is known um, and the solutions are also known. And I think what is so um, important here and what we're going to focus on in the second half of this presentation is really around action in countries, because we know this is really where we can kind of translate all of this into action on the ground. Um, so as Maria said, one of, I think, the innovations of the work that has happened in the joint monitoring program that WHO and UNICEF um, are co-leading um, is the fact of linking the data and the evidence about um, the situation of Washington healthcare facilities with practical action. And as Maria said, um, these eight practical steps have been um, put out there. And I think another really important um, component of this um, is the WASH BIT tool. And this is, of course, um, the WASH Health, Health Facility Improvement Tool. Um, and just this morning, Maggie and I were remembering back to 2016 um, in Dakar after the Ebola um, epidemic um, had drawn to a close and we had had, um, we're just really getting this work off, off the ground. And I think we can see over this time how now it's been implemented in over 33 countries. And this, of course, has the four components of water, sanitation, hygiene, and waste management, um, and really, um, you know, uses a risk management um, approach to be able to identify, address, and continually improve aspects of wash and healthcare facilities. Um, I think one of the exciting things is that this has been able, of course, to be adapted for COVID. We had a webinar series a couple weeks back with over 500 individuals, um, but also looking for Forward. Um, you know, there's other aspects, climate resilience, gender, inclusive services, um, as well as emergencies that need to be um, taken up into this work um, as we take it forward. Next slide. 
So um, in, in terms of the practical steps, we have over 40 countries um, that have reported on progress that they're making implementing the practical steps. And we see here, um, I think this is really all about incremental progress. We know we have, um, we want to arrive at universal availability of water sanitation and hygiene facilities um, available and used in healthcare facilities by 2030. But we know that each country has its own pathway um, to get there. And so these, um, this uh, reporting process looks at how these practical steps are being undertaken in countries um, and how they're implementing the roadmaps um, towards um, being able to achieve their targets. Next. Um, so far, we have over 168 commitments, so over 100 organizations have made commitments um, towards the eight practical steps. Over um, 33 countries um, have done this, so this has obviously been a great opportunity for really um, bringing around um, partners around the table to be able to work together um, on this important uh, area. Next. So the pathway um, has, as I said, it's been one um, that's been continuous. And of course, when we started 2020 um, with plans for Washington healthcare facilities work, um, you know, we didn't um, foresee how um, this pandemic would bring Washington healthcare facilities such into um, the forefront of, of this response. So I think, you know, it gives us a moment and as we kind of look at our trajectory and see how this agenda is evolving, um, I think, you know, we can see that as we now look at building back better and really reimagining that future where Washington healthcare facilities um, is a foundation of every healthcare facility around the world. And so this is kind of the trajectory that we've been on and how the initiative um, has evolved with, of course, the target, as I said, of reaching um, every user having quality care and universal Washington healthcare facilities by 2030. So these uh, are the global targets, um, and I think I'm supposed to ask people uh, to please complete the question. Um, so I hope that saying that um, makes sense um, to what you're seeing if you're following uh, this uh, event. Um, so um, the clear targets have been set and they're being tracked as part of SDG 6 and the efforts on Washington healthcare facilities. So as I said, this in, in, in encourages um, each of us in our respective countries to be able to um, set targets and make incremental progress to reach higher levels of service on things like water quality and reliability, safe handling and treatment and disposal of fecal sludge, reducing recycling and treating waste using environmentally friendly methods. So all of this is part of the change that we want to make um, in the area of WASH in healthcare facilities. Next. So what you can do, um, so as we said, this is an action-oriented um, initiative and, and, and really movement. And what we want is um, for all of you from your respective um, organizations to be able to um, join this collective vision, make a commitment and take action that will have an impact on um, the results that we want to achieve. So this could be um, in advocating for inclusion of Washington healthcare facilities as part of your country COVID plans, whether you're a donor, whether you're a country. Um, we it could also be around assessing and prioritizing rapid wash interventions um, in healthcare facilities. I remember many countries after the Ebola epidemic, like Guinea-Bissau, Mali, uh, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, all undertaking um, intense assessments to be able to also have a strong starting point for the work that they've continued to do over these years in improving Washington healthcare facilities. 
Um, it's also, of course, about, um, about uh, healthcare workers, making sure they have the right protective equipment um, and practices of being able to do, as Marie and Ira said, hand hygiene, both at work and at home. Um, hand hygiene, it's a, it's, a, it's a behavior, it's a practice, but it's also about having the right facilities and making sure that they're available and used systematically um, as part of the process. And I think last but not least, really engaging the private sector for local solutions and we just see a tremendous amount of innovation of engagement both um, in the um, product development space um, developing new types of disinfectants um, and also across supply chains um, to be able to um, bring these types of products and services to markets and so absolutely the private sector has a really important role to play in, in, in terms of making this step change in wash in healthcare facilities. Next. So um, join us um, and um, we hope that um, you can, uh, you know, make this a wash in healthcare facilities every day and every year and that really by the end of this decade, we will have um, made a difference um, on this indicator. And I think, you know, there's many things in the world that we, we, we may not be able to change, but this is one thing that we can make a difference and we can move this forward and change things for the next generation of children to be born into healthcare facilities that are safe. Um, I think if you're feeling inspired by this, you can even just go online today and make a commitment. The website um, is right there. So thank you so much. Um, and now handing back over to um, Maria. Wonderful, Kelly, as usual, and engaging and giving us tasks and everything. So wonderful. We have to move very quickly now to the next session that you and I, we are co-moderating, but with your permission, I will start and then pass it over to you. And I will start because uh, the session will be about achieving progress and overcoming challenges, and we will hear country voices, but we will make a little change in the program to make it more, uh, you know, to prove that the webinar, you can have uh, things that were not uh, planned. So we will start uh, with the um, Global Health Council uh, and inviting Lois Pace to, to, to or Marta. Uh, no, it will be in principle the Global Health Council, Lois. Uh, with your permission, I will invite you, Lois, to talk first. Thank you, Lois. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Well, um, I appreciate the change in program and uh, uh, being a sort of creative real time here. And I'm really grateful to have been a part of this discussion so far and hearing, um, looking forward to hearing about all the progress that um, countries have made uh, to ensure that there is WASH uh, in healthcare facilities. I know we at GHC were happy to support the resolution uh, uh, committed uh, and adopted by member states. Uh, and in particular, are keen uh, to see an ongoing integration uh, of WASH services and programs alongside other global health priorities such as maternal child health. Uh, and so one of my questions um, will be uh, specifically around civil society and communities, because we all know that all stakeholders will be critical in assuring the success of these programs and these goals. And so I would love to hear from country representatives and other representatives as we hear from them, to what degree communities and civil society have been engaged in these efforts in order to sustain them and ensure that we're successful. Thanks very much. Thank you, Lois. And this is a very good question to initiate our, our panel and our session, because you will be hearing from the countries. Dear co-moderator, Kelly, can I pass over to you to start with the country presentations? And I hope you will do a better job than mine with the timing. Over to you, Kelly. Thanks, Maria. Yeah, no, a pleasure. Yeah, time, time is a challenge when you've got such a fantastic topic. Um, so we are so lucky today to have a really um, stellar group of countries here today. I think really representing different regions, different country contexts. Um, so now we're going to start um, with uh, first with uh, Hungary. Um, who's going to start with their uh, country presentation and then up next after Hungary is going to be Ghana. So just Ghana if you could get ready. So Marta, um, over to you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. 
Um, I'm Marta Varga from, from Hungary. And if you could have my presentation, please, on screen. Yes. Um, the first question that we could ask is uh, why washing healthcare facilities is important in a high income country. Now, this is a question that my colleagues working in healthcare also often ask from me as a WASH person. You know, we have all the water infrastructure here. Uh, why would we worry about, do we need to worry about uh, WASH? And my answer to this is a, is a clear and loud yes, and I will tell you why. Uh, to be, begin with, we have several challenges which, which are, are shared uh, among all settings, regardless of where we are. We all can improve, no matter where we are, we can improve on our hand hygiene practices. Antimicrobial resistance is, is a challenge that we are all trying to combat. Uh, and there is always work to do on uh, infection prevention and control. Having centralized water supply and sewerage, in fact, tends to give uh, healthcare professionals a false sense of security and they might become unaware of the risks that still imply, uh, such as opportunistic pathogens in, in the water systems or uh, the inequity in access to, to wash services. And also, we are all parties to the global and regional commitments that call us to improve the situation, no matter where the baseline is, no matter where we start from. Uh, and I've heard from the ones uh, we all know, like the Sustainable Development Goals or the, the World Health Assembly Resolution itself, which is calling for uh, uh, call, uh, urging countries to take action. There are also some regional uh, initiatives in the European, pan-European region. And I would like to highlight from those, uh, the Protocol on Water and Health, which, which is a, a regional instrument focusing on the prevention of, of water-related disease through better water management. And it has dedicated a, um, a separate program area to institutional wash, focusing on schools and healthcare facilities. The next slide, please. Uh, now, while we are aware that, that we do have challenges, uh, there is, uh, in many high-income countries and in Hungary, uh, we don't have uh, sufficient data uh, to, to establish the, uh, the baseline to define where the gaps lie and, uh, uh, and to plan further development. Uh, in the order, order to, to overcome this lack of data, uh, Hungary started a situation assessment uh, last year, uh, uh, com uh, consisting of three pillars. One is the analysis of the regulatory environment, uh, including the review of the legislative instruments, the national standards, guidance documents, in order to identify uh, the strengths and the gaps in our regulatory system. The second pillar is a systematic review of the available evidence, both uh, what is published in the scientific and the gray literature, and what is captured in, in different national and international reports uh, to various uh, uh, international bodies. And the third pillar is a self-reporting questionnaire survey, uh, which was sent to uh, all inpatient healthcare facilities in, in Hungary. Um, most of these also provide outpatient care. Uh, and the questionnaire uh, was um, a quite w covering a wide range of topics of em on environmental conditions in, in uh, healthcare facilities, um, but heavily uh, featuring WASH topics as well. The questions that were, were put to the healthcare facilities were in light with JMT. Uh, adapted to, to the setting we are in and were designed so we would be able to define the as advanced level of services uh, for, uh, as an indicator. Uh, this situation assessment was supported uh, by the WHO Regional Office for Europe through the biannual collaborative agreement uh, with the Hungarian Ministry of Human Capacities. The next slide, please. Uh, what we have learned from, from this situation assessment is that uh, our regulation uh, seems to cover most aspects of, of WASH in healthcare facilities, 
usually the, the legal requirements uh, cover the infrastructural part. Marta, excuse me, just if you could wrap up, just we've got a few more countries com coming up. So just maybe the key, just maybe focus on the key points. Thanks. Okay, I'll be very brief. Thank you. So um, we did identify the missing elements. Uh, according to literature review, as I mentioned, um, opportunistic pathogens and antimicrobial resistance uh, are, few, uh, uh, are key concerns. And um, uh, from the questionnaire survey, we, uh, we uh, learned that even though the infrastructure is indeed there, uh, the accessibility is, is a challenge in, in many healthcare facilities. So these results will, will feed into uh, um, the definition of the advanced level indicator in Hungary, and also uh, will assist the development of, of um, a surveillance tool for healthcare facilities, which, which is planned to be developed uh, under the protocol on water and health. Uh, and as it's been previously highlighted, the, the COVID situation indeed directed further attention to infection prevention and control, uh, and uh, through hand hygiene, it links very closely to, uh, to uh, the wash aspects of infection control. Thank you very much. Great, Marta. Thank, thank you. And, and this is really um, impressive to see, um, you know, the steps that you've taken. And, and, you know, I can see as you're going into the end, you know, that all of this work that you've been doing over these years has obviously put you into a situation of being able to be effective in your response um, against uh, uh, the, to, to stop the transmission of COVID um, response. So thank you so much for that. Um, now turn Turning over to uh, Ghana, um, and just um, as a um, notice to Ethiopia um, and Liberia that you will be coming up next after after um, Ghana. So, uh, Dr. Samuel, over to you, and great to see your picture there. Yeah. Let's see, Dr. Samuel, are you on mute? Yeah, hello. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me, yeah, please? We, yeah, we hear All your right. voice. All right, thank you so very here. much. And we are very delighted to be given this opportunity to share our experience. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so wh what we do, what we decided to do is to put into context uh, what is happening worldwide today and looking at WASH IPC as a central point for quality of care and for successful management of the COVID-19. Fortunately enough, uh, in 2019, September 17th, Ghana did uh, organize a three-day national conference with focus on WASH IPC. The team created more awareness on WASH IPC in, uh, in few months uh, that preceded the pandemic. Now, we, in Ghana, we also have in all our health facilities appointed uh, uh, IPC focal persons, and that has actually helped in sustainability and effectiveness in monitoring activities of WASH IPC. Rapid, uh, we decided to conduct a rapid cross-sectional, uh, rap rapid cross-sectional based line assessment of facilities preparedness towards uh, response to COVID-19. We identified some few challenges. Among them was to have a lot of people trained, logistics and equipment needs among others. So we did a rapid review of our IPC guidelines to fit management of COVID-19. And then uh, we deployed Veronica buckets with water, soap, sanitizers, in strategic positions in health facilities to facilitate uh, compliance of IPC uh, measures. Next slide, please. And as part of addressing these challenges, we also decided to train uh, health facilities in WASH IPC, waste management and safe burial uh, processes. Uh, we in in indulge in training of case management teams in IPC, all frontline workers in WASH IPC, and we made sure or we ensured availability of water from the chips, the lowest uh, level of our health facilities to a quaternary hospital to the highest that we have. And we made, uh, as you might know now in Ghana, uh, we are making a compulsory the use of face masks as a present preventive measure. Uh, we train all the uh, health uh, workers involved in contact tracing, sample collectors, and um, uh, in, in IPC and surveillance. Please, next slide. Now, to continue with that, we decided that there will be the need to do, conduct a health worker exposure risk assessment 
which is currently being done to give insight and understanding on health worker risks in terms of IPC and how to manage these risks to reduce hospital acquired infections and break the transmission of the virus. We also look at training or we've trained actually the non-clinical staff in addition to the clinical staff in recognition of key roles they play in appropriate IPC practices to break the virus transmission. Uh, we've also engaged and trained our police service, military service, national security service in IPC as they are deployed during lockdowns and routine activities to avoid better transmission. And there is now an accreditation of local enterprises to produce PPEs and sanitizers as part of COVID response to mitigate the global shortage and cost of logistics. And just to add this, which is not in the slide, is that in Ghana, we have identified four policy areas that we make sure that one is infrastructure where establishing or building a health facility, the infrastructure is important because as we say, the infrastructure is the most important thing to find all these things that they should be washed IPC involved. To our national uh, uh, quality strategy plan outlines a lot of indicators in wash IPC. And three, the health facility regulatory agency, make sure that you have this before they can accredit you for, uh, to, to, for service delivery. And then we have the infrastructure unit of the Ministry of Health that makes sure that all this is being complied. We want to take the opportunity to acknowledge UNICEF, WHO, Water Aid, Ghana, uh, Ghana Health Service, Ministry of Health, and all of you for listening to us and everybody listening will be willing to take questions. Thank you so very much. Great, Dr. Samuel. Thank, thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, this was a really excellent um, presentation. And I, I just think, you know, and, and I we met in Zambia um, before this crisis, and I think, you know, we could see the comprehensive approach that you were taking with the policy infrastructure and practice and so we can see you've really been able to activate that now with the response and working with really the network that you had set up and i also really appreciated um the, you know the approach that you're taking to to address different settings from you know maybe the smaller rural um health clinics to hospitals and kind of the need to adapt that approach so um thank you um very much for that and um next up we have uh ethiopia yeah dr Jacob, over to you mr Jacob, over to you uh we can't hear you yet Uh, hello. Yep, yep perfect. Yeah, loud and clear. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I think the video is already protected, I hope. Uh, so thank you very much. So now I think you can see me. Uh, I'm Jacob and I'm from Pyramid Strafhals. I'm Director General to the Medical Services uh, Director here in the Ministry. So next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide. Thank you very much, uh, uh, here. So I can give you just a brief introduction. So after this COVID-19, so we can explore many experiences about COVID because hand hygiene and infection prevention and uh, control practice become a center of everything. So what we did was we did like a very scanning survey around Addis Ababa uh, hospitals and some high load hospitals in the university. And we found out a very critical finding that that really needs intervention uh, at this point in time. And for example, I can give you a few of the findings, uh, uh, availability of water and functional hand hygiene uh, facilities and other become a very critical challenge, uh, especially in COVID uh, isolation and treatment center. So uh, in, in collaboration with the government, we we able to uh, secure a water system for those uh, facilities and with a very big reservoir for each. So this will this is like a big opportunity for us to change at least the, the uh, water availability in uh, those hospitals. And also as emergency operating center, I. IPC and WASH become a very big section of the emergency operation in the country. And also we establish an independent team to document best experiences during this COVID response, especially in WASH and uh, IPC practice that will be scaled up after the uh, pandemic. And 
the a good news a government uh, able to allocate around 150 million Ethiopian birth, which means near to five million dollar for infection prevention and uh, patient safety uh, activities uh, for and it was allocated for 74 high load hospitals throughout the country starting from last week so uh, this will help us to at least improve infection prevention and control practice of those high load hospital in the country. Next slide. Next. So thank you very much. Oh, this is the key interventions, you know, uh, to improve water and sanitation practice in health facilities. We have two very big initiatives uh, as run by the Minister of Health as part of the national uh, mile, uh, milestone initiative. The first one is clean and safe hospital initiative. So we have been presenting about this initiative for the past two, three years in different uh, global uh, forums. So uh, we have a national audit tool where uh, hand hygiene, uh, infection control, and other wash act the availability of clean water become a center of the assessment tool. And we did a regular quarterly assessment for every hospital and we able to analyze the data and we can give um, uh, feedback to every hospital and also we have that specific, specific structure all over the country in regional health bureaus, in hospital and health centers. We have a cash focal person or cash committees that could able to identify this. And also we have introduced a new initiative now. So linking cleanness with timeliness of care. So it's as part of a national quality strategy. We link cleanness of care with timeliness of care to, to transform in institutions, especially to transform high load hospitals, university teaching hospitals, federal hospitals, and hospitals in major cities across the country. So in this one, cleanliness of care as this year uh, and next year, the Ethiopian Hospital Institution Alliance for Quality uh, focus area so that we can use this one as a positive competition for Ethiopian Health Institution Alliance for uh, Quality uh, platform. So hospital will implement the standards, will implement the checklist, and those uh, well-performing hospital will be recognized nationally by the ministry or uh, sometimes in a, by prime minister. So this will help uh, us to improve the, uh, the SWASH activities. Next slide. And Jakob, just um, if you can wrap it up because we're at the time. Thanks. So this is, this is the other uh, key intervention. So we able to integrate WASH with all the national uh, initiatives. So we are able to integrate with the national health sector quality transformation. We are able to integrate it with patient safety movement, with antimicrobial resistance uh, management movement. In, and also we are able to also incorporate it with a private sector engagement in improving the WASH practice in the country. So now we can say that WASH and APC practice be a part of uh, the national major initiatives that can be evaluated, implemented, and also monitored throughout the day, throughout the year. This is the experience from Ethiopia. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, Mr. Yakov, thank you so much. Um, and, you know, really interesting um, examples. Um, thank you so much for sharing, sharing that. Um, and uh, I think now we will move on to Liberia. Um, and then after Liberia, we will have uh, Kenya and Madagascar. Um, so, uh, Amos, over to you. Yeah, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, from Liberia, we say hi to all of the colleagues out there. Um, next slide. So uh, uh, I'm going to speak about the progress that we've made as it relates to washing health facility in Liberia. Uh, just uh, going back to 2015 when we had the Ebola outbreak, uh, Liberia uh, conducted an assessment, a national assessment on washing health facility, and that assessment was supported by UNICEF and USAID. Uh, we find out that uh, about 63% of health facility had a uh, functioning incinerator. There was also um, issues around what year round water supply. Uh, about 50% of the healthcare facility do not have or didn't have a year round uh, protected water source, which created a lot of challenges in healthcare institutions. In 2016, uh, 2016 to 2019, uh, the Ministry of Health and the National Public Institute of Liberia with support from the World Health Organization, the WHO, 
also collected data in 49 healthcare facilities uh, in 10 out of our 15 counties uh, using the, the, the compliance, you know, tool. So the score shows or uh, show 54%, 54.3% uh, in terms of uh, compliance. Uh, in 2019 to 2020, we also continue massive hand hygiene education at the community level because there's this uh, an argument that the Washington Health Facility, most of the patients are coming from communities. So we don't want to focus all of our efforts in health care facility. We have a catchment population concept wherein uh, health facilities that have catchment population will also try to extend our services there. And we will, I will speak a lot about how this is helping us in our COVID-19 uh, response. Uh, in terms of um, the healthcare waste management, we have been successful in integrating the healthcare waste uh, as part of our national accreditation standard. So initially, the accreditation of healthcare facility did not include healthcare waste. It only included anything about, uh, uh, about Hey, Mois. I think we've lost you there. Oh, we seem to be having a technical oh. difficulty. A Amos, are you there? Yeah, yeah I'm okay. here. Oh, perfect. Okay, you're back loud and clear. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Hello? Okay, so, um, yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, so in terms of, um, in terms of uh, health workforce, I, I'll share a lot of experience as it relates to the mentorship uh, in, in Liberia. We have been able to, to train a number of healthcare workers. 205 healthcare workers were trained from three counties. Uh, as part of the training, we now conducted mentorship to ensure that what trade, what, 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 whatever that was uh, taught was also reinforced by mentorship, wherein we have a national level team that goes to these healthcare facilities, sit with the technicians on ground, the environmental health workers, uh, help them to, to do, you know, uh, waste segregation, uh, color coding of, uh, of uh, waste bins, but also talk to the nurses and, and guide them in terms of uh, waste separation from the generating source to the end, uh, the treatment facility. Uh, in, when we when we had cases of uh, COVID-19, Liberia did not have a treatment unit. So most of the isolation centers are from the city, precautionary observation center where we took travelers for quarantine, they were hotels. Those hotels did not were not engineer healthcare facilities. So learning from our wash in health facility, you know, mentorship program, we then took those skills to those hotels wherein we ensure that the, the waste that was generated, I mean, the PPE that we use, which are medical waste that was generated were segregated. And then uh, food that was taken to the healthcare, I mean, to the hotel were also properly uh, managed. And then we had a team of healthcare workers, environmental technicians that were now taking these waste to a, a centralized waste treatment plant that we now have at Disco Hill. We also, supply uh, waste materials to this precautionary observation center, which we call the POCs and treatment uh, center. We have a treatment center in Monrovia now, uh, which is the 14th military hospital. We have a dedicated Oh. Amos, we've yeah. lost you. Oh, are you back? Oh. Uh, hello? Yeah, yeah, you're back. Yeah, just so, if you could wrap up, just we're getting over time. Thanks. Yeah, so so basically we have uh, 75. Oh, yeah, Imo, sounds like we're we're losing uh, you there. Yeah. If sorry, yeah. So ma the major challenge that we have, uh, sorry about this, uh, is, is limited.
sorry, Amos, I think we're going to have to move on. We've, we've lost you there, but I think we really see um, the challenge that you've uh, highlighted there. I think Liberia is such a good example of really seeing how you had good data um, before the, 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 this uh, latest COVID epidemic and that that's helped you have a good understanding of the situation. Um, and yeah. also, I think you put your finger on this issue of capacity um, using kind of this mentorship. That's a really interesting um, example. And I think just putting your finger on this issue also of inequalities and kind of the special needs of addressing communities and healthcare facilities where there may be poor wash conditions, whether they're slums or peri-urban areas or informal um, settlements. So I'm sorry, we're going to have to um, move on now to the next uh, country, which is, um, oh, it's not a country. It's actually uh, UNICEF um, from the East and Southern Africa Regional Office. So Fatima, over to you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Can you hear me? Yes, it's very clear. Thank you. Over. Thank you. I would like to start my presentation uh, by expressing my sincere gratitude to all frontline health workers including their loved ones. Um, I don't see my slides. Okay, thank you so much. Um, as, it, as it is very evident from the graph that over the past few decades, Eastern and Southern Africa region has made dramatic uh, progress in the reduction of maternal and newborn mortality. But is it enough? No, because still many of our countries are far behind uh, in reaching their targets for SDGs. One must remember that there's no shortcut or magic bullet to reduce maternal and newborn mortality. It needs concentrated and contextualized efforts uh, from all sectors of society, including health sector, to provide quality of care where washing health facilities plays a vital role and this pandemic is teaching us that hard lesson. Slide two. So in the spirit to provide evidence-based support to country offices, in 2019, we conducted a scoping study to understand the situation of uh, WASH in healthcare facilities. Overall, our region scored good uh, in the, it was 60, around 60% 60 um, in, uh, in the enabling environment, which suggests it's, it's a good result, but at the same time, the study also highlighted the need to con concentrated efforts to, pro to accelerate progress in subsectors. After this resolution and then our, after our meeting also in, in um, Zambia, we see that it created a great momentum around countries. And we are seeing some best practices, which you could see in the picture. And we are also seeing that countries are going forward to do in-depth assessments. And also we are trying to incorporate WASH and IPC indicators into routine HMIS systems. So these are some of the gains. Um, shall we go on to slide three? The unfortunate fact is that COVID pandemic will, weak, will weaken our already underdeveloped and fragile health systems and may have worse implications on, on the gains which we have made so far. Recent estimates by researchers from John Hopkins informs, uh, inform us that in our region, due to um, decrease in coverage of routine healthcare services uh, and increase in child waste, just in six months, we could see more preventable death for under five children and, and mothers. And all those deaths are linked to both access and quality of care. And again, I would say quality is incomplete with, without IPC and proper wash and san sanitation services. With the wish that these estimates never turn into reality, we must make some quick actions now and let us turn this crisis into, into an opportunity for our mothers and newborn. And for that, I would like to quickly recommend four, uh, three actions. First, we should not deal COVID as a vertical public health emergency. It's a time to invest on health systems, including wash and sanitation infrastructure. And it is a time to lay gra groundwork for building back better. We, secondly, we need to reinforce national linkages between 
WASH services IPC measures and make some deliberate efforts to bring the concept of humanitarian and development nexus into life. I think this is a peak time we could do that. Lastly, let us explore more innovative financing options for the resilient and sustainable solutions around washing health facilities. I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks immensely, Fatima. And I think you've, you know, just really um, so clearly demonstrated these critical links between uh, quality of care, IPC, and watch and healthcare facilities with, um, with, uh, with ending preventable... Oops. <laughs> with uh, ending preventable deaths of mothers and newborns. Um, and I think you've really highlighted and made the case um, for the need to invest in health systems as we're all uh, building back better. So thank, thank you so much for that. And I think, as you said, it's a continuum between the response, the recovery, and really um, building back the, the resilience that we need in our health um, systems and healthcare facilities, including WASH. So now we're going to go to the last two uh, interventions. So we're going to go first now to to, uh, Madagascar um, and with uh, Dr. Noro Hasina um, and then um, our final presenter will be joining us from uh, Cambodia so if Cambodia can, can get ready so uh, Dr. Noro Hasina over to you. Bonjour à tous, c'est avec un réel plaisir donc, que je vais vous présenter l'expérience de Madagascar en matière de gestion des déchets médicaux dans la lutte contre la COVID-19. Madagascar dispose de politiques nationales de kits de gestion des déchets médicaux et tous les hôpitaux de référence de prise en charge des cas de COVID-19 positifs appliquent donc les recommandations de cette politique et de ce guide. Et tous les déchets générés par la prise en charge des cas de COVID-19 positifs sont traités comme des déchets infectieux, étant donné donc que ces déchets sont déjà en contact avec euh, euh, les malades. Environ 100 à 200 litres de déchets par jour sont produits par les unités de prise en charge des cas de COVID-19 dans les hôpitaux. Pour améliorer la gestion des déchets dans les centres de prise en charge des cas de COVID-19, euh, nous avons mené des supervisions formatives dans ces centres de santé et on en a été créé parmi les thèmes de supervision également la PCI, prévention et contrôle des infections, et la pratique d'hygiène et assainissement. Nous leur avons donné également des affiches de sensibilisation et mis en place des mécanismes de rapportage de la gestion des déchets dans ces centres de euh, traitement. Euh, prochainement, nous projetons donc de mener des séances de rappel aux responsables d'hygiène, aux hygiénistes, aux agents de surface, les euh, mesures de PCI, précaution, contrôle des infections, le, les pratiques d'hygiène et la gestion des déchets médicaux. Nos principaux défis consistent surtout donc à la disponibilité des matériels et équipements de gestion des déchets dans des autres hôpitaux de district ou centres de santé de base qui seront appelés à mener des activités de sensibilisation vu l'évolution exponentielle des cas ici à Madagascar, mais également la gestion des déchets solides. Je vous remercie de votre aimable attention. Bon, je vous remercie beaucoup, uh, Dr. Noro Hasina. Um, and now we are going to go on to Cambodia. So, Dr. Ear Poor, are you there? Dr. Ear, can you? We're having trouble hearing you. Maybe check if your mute is off. Well, it seems that we're having trouble to connect with Dr. Dr. Ear. Um, so, um, 
so maybe we can come back to Dr. Ear um, for the for the questions if we're not able uh, to connect right now. Um, Please. Oh, are you there? Yeah. Dr. Yes, I'm here. Oh, Sorry. Perfect. Okay, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, let's move to the first slide, maybe. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so Cambodia has seen a significant improvement in the health sector, mainly in improving access to healthcare and service coverage. But uh, we observe the quality of care remain a major concern in both public and private sector. And then uh, quality has become a priority, uh, which of course was as a precondition. And then number of traditional innovative approaches have been made to improve quality of care in the country. I would like to bring your attention to one innovative project we call Health Equity and Quality Improvement Project, HEQUIT, for which the project has uh, include a performance-based grant and a fixed grant, as you can see on the left-hand side uh, uh, flowchart. Uh, performance-based uh, grant will help to provide health facility as a performance-based uh, uh, incentive to improve quality. At the same time, the health facility also receive additional fixed grant to support uh, uh, infrastructure and facility as a part of operating, uh, operating cost. In this project, quality improvement focus on both the process, structure, and outcome. So outcome based on interview with the patient satisfaction. Structure uh, include mainly uh, 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 management and then uh, as you can see there is also a, a built-in uh, uh, infection prevention and control and then the process of care as a knowledge. So uh, what has been also considered as a precondition for quality and then is priority and then we have developed a national was guideline. At the same time a number of indicators are embedded in this uh, uh, a key project and also a national uh, quality monitoring in all public health facility and then all of them have been uh, evaluated and assessed quarterly with the score. Next slide please. So during the COVID-19 as you can see in the graph that our uh, COVID uh, situation uh, apparently the first wave has finished and we are now working hard to prevent the second wave. During the, since the beginning of the outbreak, uh, in addition to the, the current and routine effort made to improve WASH and IPC, there are some more effort to improve IPC in the country, mainly through more additional training to healthcare workers, providing more supply mainly to the big facility which are more working related to the COVID. And also at the same time, uh, public education through different uh, channels to improve people hygiene, mainly hand hygiene. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So as a result, we observe a significant improvement in uh, was indicator in the country since uh, five, six years ago. And, but then uh, we observe some challenges. Uh, as you can see on the, on the graph on the left hand side, uh, many other components see more larger improvement than uh, IPC as the most difficult part to get improved. And mainly in that part, it's including mainly healthcare waste management and health hygiene practices, and mainly the practice around maternity care. So we observe also with the COVID uh, uh, situation, there are a lot of effort uh, and push to put the uh, IPC standard higher and also the, we observe some change uh, in hygiene practices, mainly in hand hygiene in some facilities which are working on involved with the, the, the COVID-19. But uh, it seems like uh, after uh, the, the COVID-19 is receding, the situation is going uh, more stable now and uh, we observe also some practice have been changed. So we think that uh, maybe of course, we need more improvement, but uh, it's maybe also good to maintain some of the quality uh, and hygiene practice that we have achieved so far during the COVID, but uh, it's maybe a challenge. So from the National Institute of Public Health perspective, we are based, uh, we will continue to support the national effort to improve was mainly IPC. 
through mainly our role at the Public Health Institute to, to help the government to assess the situation and to build up the, the national indicator, including understanding the knowledge, practice, and attitude of the different key population, mainly a highly population, including the cleaner that is not uh, paid enough attention for the moment. At the same time, we will also uh, uh, continue to do research in the IPC and also in hand hygiene behavior as the, currently we have one project together with London School Hygiene Tropical Machine and Water Edge. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Ewan. I just yeah, really want to congratulate you um, and all of the, 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 the countries that presented here today on the measurable progress you're making. And I think, you know, just this last graph that you had up there, I mean, it shows that you do know where the challenges are and that you are making progress. So um, I think, you know, your point is really well taken um, that, you know, especially in areas like IPC, of course, COVID-19 uh, response. Um, is really calling on these higher IPC standards and hand hygiene, which have been some of the areas of greatest challenge. So I think this really kind of sets out some of the priorities that, that we need to have as we're taking this agenda forward on how can we sustain these gains and make sure that they become uh, contributing to, to, to long-term uh, progress um, in these uh, areas. So, um, so this wraps up the country presentations. So I am really pleased now to call on um, our water aid colleague, uh, Dado Kojo, um, who is going to uh, join us to ask a question. So Dado, great, great uh, to see you there. And, and thanks uh, if you can uh, ask your question. Over. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. These have all been very exciting accounts of progress to date. My question goes to Dr. Kaba. The COVID-19 response has shown the fragile health infrastructure, the inequalities in access to safe, clean water, and the added burden on women as caregivers, women as service users, and women as service providers. In Ghana, there have been reports that women are not seeking timely antenatal and delivery services due to, among other things, the fear of safety of the facility. My question is this. How is your work in Washington healthcare facilities tackling gender and inequality? And how does the Minister of Health track and use this data? Thank you very much. Uh, Ellie, dear co-moderator, can I make a suggestion here? Yeah. Ellie? Yes, 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 of course. Yeah, we're just, uh, yeah, I think the question was, yeah, go ahead, uh, Maria. Yeah. My suggestion is because we are running so late with time and, and, and because we have some fantastic pres presentations in front of us, I think Dedo question can be answered to the next presentation, so we will try to make sure that uh, it's addressed there. I think it's a best way, a very good way to start with the next uh, panel, maybe on the focus on the health workforce, and then the, um, the quality, I mean, the investing on WASH. Um, what do you think, Kelly? Yeah, no, I think that's a great, a great idea. I think, you know, this is really, this session has really emphasized the need to take stock um, of where we are, look at these key priorities in COVID and beyond. And I think, you know, we coming back to the presentation, Maria, that you and I made the need to kind of set targets, uh, update our roadmaps, and really set out um, a pathway on those eight practical steps. So I think this has really um, helped us to kind of see how this all fits together. Um, you know, not only looking at the public health angle, but also other important issues like climate resilience and other things that could create shocks on our um, healthcare facilities going forward. Yeah, so um, back over to you, Maria. Uh, well, I think- or It needs to go, I think, now to Shams and Elizabeth for the next session. Exactly. I will propose yeah. that it goes to um, Professor Wendy Graham. Wendy, okay. you have the next session. Oh, we are moving directly to the last one. Mm. 
Okay, here we are. Good. Thank you so much. Wendy, last year you were making such a funny presentation. This year, I'm afraid, my dear, that uh, is very challenging. Over to you, make it short, make it very strategic, and we hope that we will be able to hear as well from the investing in WASH in healthcare facility. Wendy, over to you, and where is your mob? Okay, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Mira. Uh, is, is it audible? Just to check. Yes. It's fine. Okay, thank you. So this is a really important session, as all of them are, but uh, we're running a little bit tight, so I'll be very, very brief, and it's a pleasure to be the moderator. Um, a few words of introduction, Dr. Nero, as all was mentioned already, that last year I had the pleasure of being with you in Geneva when I came to the podium with a mop, uh, which caused a bit of disruption, and I presented Dr. Tedros with the Mop of Honour, which was about his support for a clean revolution a clean revolution in which all health workers will be able to practice environments fit for purpose in terms of WASH and IPC, so keeping patients and themselves safe. <laughs> I can hardly believe what a different situation we are in. The world is turned upside down, but never before has there been a greater need for a clean revolution, for clean hands, clean surfaces, clean care. We must not let this collective amnesia that Dr. Mike Ryan mentioned continue. We must make sure this, this uh, attention to hygiene continues well beyond COVID-19. But I'm very touched to be asked to speak on behalf of the, or moderate this session on the healthcare workforce, because although I'm, I am still a professor of epidemiology without a mop, um, I've gone back into the clinical area and become part of the health, health workforce. And I have to say, seeing and practicing donning and doffing of PPE and seeing here in the UK the challenges if you didn't have access to water. I can only feel really heart moved in terms of the impact for our colleagues overseas. So I think it's really important, I use these words of introduction to mention that we have to have a broad definition of the health workforce that must include cleaners, the laundry workers, the porters, Health workforces depend on a much, much broader range of individuals, as some of the speakers have already mentioned. And I want to end by saying that health workers are not just health workers. We have to remember they are individuals with multiple roles, moving between family and community. And when we fail those health workers with poor wash and poor PPE, placing them at risk physically and mentally, we are also failing their families and communities. In other words, we're failing everyone. But now, if we deliver on the COVID resolution and the commitments that have been made, then there is an opportunity to turn things round and to make sure I do not need to come back next year with a, water, with a mop in my hand. So on that note, I'd like to introduce the five amazing panelists who are going to use their three minutes each without slides to speak from different areas or perspectives of the health workforce. And I'd like to turn first to Howard Catton, who's the CEO from the International Council of Nurses. Thank you. Uh, Wendy, hi. Um, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the opp opportunity. For those who don't know the International Council of Nurses, uh, we are the international body um, representing uh, nursing. Uh, we have over 130 national nursing associations in a membership. Um, and currently there are about 28 million nurses worldwide. This is a very special year uh, for nursing midwifery because it's the first time that WHO have designated it the year of the nurse and the midwife and it coincides with the 200th anniversary of the birth of Florence Nightingale um, and uh, when we think about Florence for those of you who don't know about Florence uh, she uh, not only was the mother of uh, founder of modern nursing but I think in many ways lays claim to being uh, a key founder of modern day infection prevention and control measures in the Crimea War, she identified that more soldiers were dying in hospital than on the battlefield, and she revolutionized the approach to hygiene, to sanitation, to the use of clean water. Um, but it wasn't just that she changed uh, practice and nursing practice um, in itself, she also uh, led, that, uh, led those changes by the use of data and statistics. She took practice into policy making and when she went back to the UK she was a leading person who instigated a Royal Commission on how hospital services were organised. Those three key tenants from Florence about practice, 
policy and leadership, I think are hugely relevant today um, to the situation that we're dealing with with, uh, with coronavirus. We are seeing clearly um, the reality of modern day uh, nursing, um, not just care and compassion, but the, the technical skills, the complexity, the bravery and the courage as well. Um, but unfortunately, we are not protecting our nurses and our healthcare workers in any way uh, near enough. Um, at ICN, we have been tracking infection rates amongst healthcare workers and deaths as well. We believe that there are probably around 150,000 healthcare worker infections as a result of COVID in a small amount of countries that we've been able to identify the data from. Um, we are aware of more than 350 nurses who have died worldwide as a result of contracting uh, corona virus and this data is not being collected in a standardized and systematic way we think that that is a scandal because we think that that data would be hugely important to add to our understanding uh, and knowledge of coronavirus and help us to improve infection prevention and control uh, measures we have also seen nurses and healthcare workers who have been attacked in some countries as well as a result of the work that they are doing um, which points to the hugely important issue of clear public health messages and advice as well to public who are often fearful and anxious but then the consequences of that fear that anxiety um, in some places have been this unacceptable uh, attacks and assaults on health care workers what we are seeing though is nursing leadership come to the fore we're talking to associations right around the world who are playing central roles in planning coordination of countries coronavirus efforts and I think that there's a really important lesson here as well that this isn't about just having medical leadership uh, in response to COVID and infection prevention and control it's a multidisciplinary effort of which nursing plays a major part and what we are seeing is the connections the golden thread between practice informing policy and health systems uh, design um, Final issue just to highlight is clearly, as we all know, that coronavirus has exposed our lack of preparedness, the, you know, no stockpiles of PPE in many countries. We went into this with a shortage of six million, uh, six million nurses. Um, when we say that uh, we need strong health systems, when we say that the lessons, the legacy from uh, what we're going through now must be that we invest in health systems and health services that's that's absolutely right but let's strip it down to um the health workforce the bedrock nursing and the wider health workforce being the bedrock the building blocks of any health system uh, and the applause and the thanks that we're seeing now uh we want translated into uh, investment and resources and nursing and wider healthcare professionals uh, retaining their leadership seats at top tables as 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 well. Um, that's it from me, Wendy. Thanks very much. Thank you, Howard. Uh, very inspiring and very relevant in this year of Florence's uh, 200th anniversary. So thank you. I'm turning now, I believe, to a, ta a, a, a video that's going to be shown from Tanzania. And this is in connection with Atuni Shebi Bemba from Muhambili. I'm not working, working the control, so I leave. Hello, my name is Atuni Bemba, a registered nurse working at Muhambili Orthopedic Institute in Tanzania. Tanzania is located in East Africa with estimated population of 59.5 million people. In terms of my responsibility at MOI is to determine, prevent, and contain infectious outbreak in the facility. And second is to ensure that standard precautions are followed. Now, let us see the situation of washing healthcare facility before. Research carried by Water Aid Tanzania and UNICEF on the ground showed that status of washing in healthcare facilities was not good and that healthcare workers and patients were at risk of serious infections and thus in compromising the ability to provide quality nursing care to patients. And that may cause health risk to patients and healthcare providers. WASH is very important for safe nursing management of patients in healthcare facility. The absence of safe and clean water, improved sanitation facilities 
and lack of functional hand washing facilities lead to significant health risk to patients, caregivers, and healthcare providers. Following the identification of gaps in healthcare facilities and realizing the importance of wash in healthcare facilities, government, development partners, and international non government organizations took various measures to improve the status of wash in healthcare facilities in Tanzania. Those measures are development of wash in healthcare facilities national guidelines, inclusion of wash in healthcare facilities in the water sector development plan phase two, more emphasis on behavior change in the current national sanitation campaign. Additionally, after investment of wash in healthcare facilities, government, development partners, and international non-government organizations have managed to improve the status of wash in healthcare facilities by improving sanitation services, providing safe running water, and improvement in hygiene behavior, particularly in hand hygiene practices, as a critical element for delivery of quality nesting care. And after infection prevention and control education in healthcare facilities, personal behaviors of nurses and other healthcare workers started to change. Now, let us see how the COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced the importance of a skilled, trained, and empowered workforce to ensure a hygienic environment. Although we all know how important to have skilled and trained workforce in healthcare facilities. COVID-19 has demonstrated the importance of the trained health force, particularly frontline healthcare workers. Frontline healthcare workers have demonstrated their vital role, capacity, and commitment in responding to COVID-19 in Tanzania. And this has been witnessed in other countries as well. COVID-19 has also demonstrated the importance and the central role of WASH, particularly the role and position of hygiene as defensive mechanism. It therefore member countries, development partners, private sector, and other key actors at the local and global level make WASH a priority in the fight against COVID-19. Thank you very much indeed, Satuni. Uh, great to hear from a frontline health worker. And now we turn to one of our next generation of health workers. And this is Katja Chich, who's going to talk from the IFSMA perspective. Thank you, Katja. Hi, very happy to be here. Uh, so as students, we are already a part of the health workforce. And as healthcare professionals in training, we are also the health workforce of the future, which is why it's imperative that we as youth are involved in these discussions. Washing healthcare facilities is an important aspect for medical and other healthcare students. We learn about the topic quite early on, however, throughout their studies, Oftentimes, what we have learned isn't necessarily reflected in real life. One of the main challenges for students coming into the profession is that we learn about the optimal state of wash in healthcare facilities, but later see in our clinical rotations that everything is not as it was in the book. In reality, we are faced with the exact same issues as the current health workers. No water service for them also means no water service for us. Same goes for lack of soap or disinfectant, healthcare waste management conditions, wash infrastructure, and so on. This gap between our former learning and practical experience can impact our education and learning opportunities in a negative way. And we for sure do not want to be lacking in this department when it comes to our future professions, since we do want to provide the best possible healthcare. We care about the future of our patients and communities and thus put a lot of focus on improving our curricula, but such curricula cannot come to life if in healthcare facilities if key stakeholders are not prioritizing action and investment when it comes to WASH. As IFMSA, we represent 1.3 million students, not just from medical, but also from other health backgrounds from 129 countries altogether. We work a lot at the grassroots and do a lot of work through community engagement. So access to up-to-date information on WASH, infection prevention and control practices are crucial for meaningful youth participation, as well as the quality of our activities. Last but not least, we're also big advocates for environmental health and universal health coverage, which both go hand in hand with the importance of WASH. We believe that ensuring access to WASH services is an integral step to achieving UHC in a sustainable manner. One of the big messages of this year's World Health Assembly was that fighting COVID-19 and achieving universal health coverage requires a whole of society approach, 
And as youth, we are a part of the society as well. As students, we are passionate and socially committed to making a difference, as well as highlighting the healthcare issues that too often fall into the background. So to conclude, we would like to call on all decision makers to put WASH in healthcare facilities on top of their agenda and make sure that the healthcare facilities will be able to support our efforts as future healthcare professionals in providing sustainable, safe, and quality care. Thank you. Thank you, Katja. It's uh, wonderful to have such a good ambassador for the next generation and for the health workforce, and good luck with your studies. Um, if I could move on to the next of our panelists, we have Dr. Pam Lee Yu Fong from the Ministry of Health in Malaysia as an IPC specialist. So Dr. Fong, over to you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you very thank much you. for this invitation for me to share on how Malaysia supports our health workforce for, for WASHED. To start, I would like to mention that in Malaysia, majority of rural healthcare facilities are connected to the public water supplies Although during irregular supplies, sanitary wells, rainwater harvesting and gravity feed systems, for instance, are used as alternatives. In supporting COVID-19 efforts, IPC preparedness audits were actually conducted in healthcare facilities prior to the pandemic in January to facilitate our health workforce in achieving WASH agendas. To support our workforce in providing patient care, especially in the time of COVID, Hand hygiene facilities such as sinks or alcohol-based hand rubs are available at the point of care, usually at patient's feet. Sinks are equipped with wall-mounted soaps and also with tissues, beans, posters and on hand hygiene steps. And to further spark further commitment from all key players for washed, alcohol-based hand rubs that have met the WHO criteria as an essential medicine have been approved by the Malaysian Ministry of Health for its, most importantly, sustainable supply to healthcare facilities. For training and education of our workforce, Hand Hygiene Train the Trainers workshop were echoed in 2019 throughout all states and federal territories in Malaysia. Also, it is made mandatory for all newly appointed staff to undergo orientation on IPC measures, which includes WASHED. In order to feedback on existing resources and achievements of our workforce, hand hygiene compliance audits are performed quarterly. To support this, WASH and IPC audit trainings have been implemented in post-basic IPC courses and will be implemented in diploma IPC courses in Malaysia too. As a reminder to our workforce to be mindful of WASH, hand hygiene courses in English are made visible and also translated into our local dialect whenever possible. Since last year, Malaysia encouraged nudging from colleagues as well as using role models as walking reminders. Malaysia has created a non-punitive safety climate for our health workforce and had taken into consideration various behavioral, cultural, social and organizational factors in wash planning. An example of this outcome is the Malaysian Action Plan on AMR, which is focused to reduce the incidence of infection through effective sanitation, hygiene, and infection prevention measures. In conclusion, according to the Joint External Evaluation by WHO, which was conducted in October last year, and by reflecting on last year's resolution on WASH, the standard design of healthcare facilities in Malaysia accommodates WASH agendas. All healthcare facilities and referral hospitals have suitable WASH facilities that are functional, which exist along with national programs for continuous professional training of our health workforce, including training of our facility cleaners, which is proven to be crucial during this pandemic. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Pam. That was very, very clear indeed. And it's sweetness to my ears. Uh, it is so important that we keep IPC and WASH on the same page. That's right. Thank you. And we're now turn last but not least is the wonderful Kaveri Myra. I had pleasure of speaking alongside her last year in Geneva. So Kaveri, over to you. 
Thank you, Wendy. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yes, fine. Thank you. So in this strange new world, what remains unchanged is that midwives and nurses still form the bulk of health workforce at the front line. And around 70% of them are women. The gender-based challenges persist and WASH continues to be a matter of dignity, safety, and equity. I interviewed some nurses and midwives working at the COVID-19 frontline in India and Uganda, and I will share their voices through these five quick quotes. Names changed, of course. Ajay is a community health officer, says there is no toilet in the health center. It was an emergency, so I went behind the bushes. The student from a nearby school where I give health education saw me squatting. They called me a hypocrite. Faith, a midwife from Uganda, says, sharing toilets with men is a challenge in the rural areas, which sometimes are logged due to shortage of water. Where toilets are available, they are far, and we are lucky if it is in the same building. Our lives are very hard. Radhika is a nurse in charge in India. She says, menstruating in PP is tricky, especially if you are used to heavy flow. Then there is a chance you might stain your suit as the material of our PP is of poor quality too. It is shameful to share these things, but it is obvious. So the administrators should be sensitive. The food we are given here gave us diarrhea. How do we manage that wearing PP? Samta is an auxiliary nurse midwife working in the community, says being a woman, it is not dignified to ask a stranger every time I want to use the toilet, neither it is to go outside. Kirti is a staff nurse who recently tested positive. She says, many have fainted after wearing the PP. We are dehydrated and not drinking water. Nurses are being diagnosed with urinary tract infections. And post UTI, one cannot hold for very long and starts leaking. And you want to talk about dignity. Midwives and nurses feel they're facing these challenges because they don't have midwives and nurses leading and representing them in decision and policy making at every level. And it is high time we changed that. 2020 is our year after all. So I think think tanks like WHO, UNICEF and WaterAid have a responsibility to lead by example. Start hiring more nurses and midwives in all your departments and then start advocating to countries to involve more midwives and nurses which can begin at virtual meetings like these, where I see not one, but I think three or four nurses and midwives. So congratulations on that. So next time you are on a panel about health, including WASH, and you do not see midwives and nurses, refuse to be a part of it and help the organizers fix it. Not for the midwives, not for the nurses, but the people we are making these policies for. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Over to you, Wendy. Thank you very much, Kavari. That's inspiring as usual and uh, lovely the way you brought in the voices of those on the ground that cannot join us today. So thank you very much. And you, you put a challenge to us about not joining panels without nurses and midwives being represented. <laughs> really important point. Thank you very much indeed. So I just need to say thank you to all of the panelists who spoke, the video from Tanzania, all, all speakers I think have really taken us on a journey and reminded us that we, we, we do need to make sure we protect our healthcare workforce, we in a better place next year and if we honour the commitments that are being made then we could indeed be in a much much better place with no amnesia. Thank you very much indeed. And I'll now pass over to the two moderators of the next session, which is Shams and Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you so much and greetings everybody. Um, Maria, with your permission, should we continue? Okay, wonderful. So today, um, it's just such a, a wonderful pleasure to be with you all. And uh, Maria, thank you and, and the organizing team for bringing us together. Just a few opening remarks from my side. Um, I have the pleasure of uh, facilitating this with my dear colleague, uh, Elizabeth Eero, but just a few remarks. It's been said, but I think it needs to be restated. We simply cannot speak about quality of care or quality of health services without focused attention on WASH. And that is a critical, critical link. Um, the country experiences that we heard of this today have alluded to that very strongly. And for those uh, with us today, this may be intuitive, but we all have a responsibility to shout about this. 
this, if this transition from resolution to revolution uh, is going to take place. So we do need intentional system-wide investment. And that's the focus of this session. Intentional system-wide investment for WASH to attain sustainable quality services at the facility level. And in the current COVID context, that intentional investment has a number of entry points. So of course, quality of care for people with COVID, but also, and importantly, maintaining essential health services, making sure that that investment goes towards health service recovery and sustained transformative strengthening of quality health services in the post-pandemic phase. So this is what's clearly mentioned by Mike and Maria at the beginning to really allow us not to go into this amnesia mode, which is still possible. So it's a real responsibility for those of us today coming together. <coughs> Elizabeth, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Sham. Um, again, um, real honour to be moderating the session with, with you. Um, and just a, a couple of comments from me in regards to the session as part of my introductory to the session. I think this is a, an excellent opportunity indeed to refocus on the global targets on WASH and health facilities and remind and urge countries and partners to promote a safe and secure working environment for every household including working aids on, and tools, safe water, sanitation and hygiene services, and hygiene supplies for efficient and safe service to the world. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected every health system in the world. We have witnessed the spotlight and the impact on nurses and healthcare workers at the front line, as well as many succumbing to the virus and infection and death. At the same time, neonatal and maternal care remain a critical and essential service and continue to support women uh, give birth, applying principles of infection prevention and control measures to ensure safety for both mother and baby. We are witnessing the issue of WASH and its impact on the safety and quality of healthcare responses highlighted during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, reinforcing the need to invest in fundamental aspects to strengthen health systems, including WASH. Alongside the 2020 year of the Nursing and Midwife, this year's uh, Global Hand Hygiene Campaign, we recognise the, the critical role in the uh, uh, advocacy and hand hygiene practices and the campaign on nurses and midwives, clean care is in your hands. But a safe pair of hands can only be attained when you access hand hygiene resources at the right times, which requires aspects of water, sanitation and hygiene be available in all facilities, including maternity units. To sustain best IPC and WASH practice, critical investment is definitely needed. Thank you, uh, Sham. I'll, I'll revert back to you to uh, uh, introduce our next speakers. Thanks. Wonderful. And, and we won't spend too much time on introducing, but it's a pleasure to, 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 to hand over to Claire, Claire Chase uh, to start us off. Claire. Hi, uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, what I wanted to do today, uh, I don't see my slide up here. Can somebody put the slide? Thank you. Uh, what I wanted to, to talk about today is, is a bit um, to share the progress uh, that the World Bank has made and how we're uh, really approaching this challenge of sustainability, uh, it, especially in light of the COVID emergency. Um, so you've heard from Jennifer and Mohammed at the beginning, and I, I just am here to give you a bit more detail on, on where we are in the progress. So following the call to action and the uh, resolution, we at the World Bank, we took a look into our portfolio to try to understand um, where we are investing in WASH and healthcare facilities. So this is pre-COVID. We, we were able to find uh, 22 projects. This is across the water and the health portfolio not a large share of our overall portfolio because in the water and sanitation uh, portfolio alone, we have 144 projects. 
the other the other thing to mention is that we're not always investing in a comprehensive wash package, and that's driven uh, by our counterparts, uh, by the ministries that we're working with. As we know, sometimes sanitation is Ministry of Health, where we have water and 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 water ministry. Uh, but about three out of five projects were investing either or both of water supply and sanitation, and two out of five projects were investing in hygiene or hand washing. The other area where we need to do a better job is on operations and maintenance. So only 42% of projects are explicitly addressing operations and maintenance. And I think the, the best case scenario that we've seen is, is part of our program for results financing, where we're tying the disbursement of loan proceeds to achievement of functionality and maintenance of the facility. So we, we need to see more of that. On medical waste management, um, we need to go back to the, to the projects, uh, at least in the water practice. Uh, we only have one project which is investing in waste management, but medical waste management is a, is a core part of our health operations. If not uh, covered in the in the project itself, it's included as part of the safeguard for the uh, for the loan. And then, on environmental cleaning, we we don't see much explicitly around this area. It's been raised as a really critical area. Obviously, now with the COVID pandemic, this is going to uh, become even more of an issue. So, so we need to understand better how this is being integrated. Now, I want to share that um, through the COVID-19 fast track facility. Um, that, that Mohammed spoke about, we've almost doubled the number of projects which are investing in wash and healthcare facilities. So I think this is a, this is a good achievement that we need to really um, take this opportunity. We are, obviously these are emergency investments, so we need to come back in to be sure that we're transitioning these systems to sustainable um, operations going forward. Uh, so let me stop there and um, Oh, back over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Very clear and a tangible, real portfolio of investments across the world. Just in the interest of time, we'll move on now to um, Ben Sims from FET. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for inviting me to contribute. Um, thank you, Shams, to Elizabeth in particular for this session. I really welcome this opportunity to register FET's support for this focus um, in this World Has Assembly Week. Um, the need to promote timely, life-saving hand hygiene and the need for infrastructure to support this was the centerpiece of FET's written submission to the WHA as an NGO in official relations. And it underpins this need for a comprehensive WASH approach. I agree with other speakers that COVID-19 really does concentrate the minds. Lives are on the line. This work, this progress is vital. The UK, where I'm sitting, is in the midst of our own very traumatic experience of COVID-19. In this country, this week, we're reporting that more than 175 health workers have died. And yet, despite our national preoccupations, which are understandable, there is a flourishing network of individuals across our National Health Service who are looking outwards, using the institutional health partnership approach. And that's what I really want to talk about um, today. The health partnership approach is, a, is, a, is the twinning of hospitals and centres in the UK with their counterparts overseas. And I have to say, it's not um, a uniquely British thing. Um, the WHO have promoted this for a long time under the twinning partnerships for improvement approach. And my colleagues, as I speak, are providing you with links to that on the Slack discussion. But there are also many other countries that are partnering between health systems in the way that I'm describing. But the point about this is uh, that travel may have stopped, um, but the trust, the ties of collegiality, the professional respect that has been built up over many years of collaboration between individuals and institutions, these ties are alive and well, and they are surviving COVID-19. And in some ways, technology is giving us greater fluency than we've ever had before. What I want to share about the partnership approach is, I suppose, three excitements. One is these are powerful channels for sharing expertise, for sharing lived experience, for 
expressing solidarity between health workers across borders. But secondly, health partnerships are mutually beneficial. These are great grounds, these are great um, learning um, laboratories um, where people can really innovate. And thirdly, they're very practical. And it's that practical dimension um, that really appeals about institution, institutional health partnerships. They ground national policies, they ground those global intentions in practical expression at an institutional level, operating within the WH guidance. I'm showing you a slide now which gives you a sense of the scale of the partnerships that that in particular is associated with. Um, but it's, it's, it's examples like the University Hospital Leicester, who are partnering with Gonda University Hospital in Ethiopia. One practical intervention that ran for two years was the focus, had a focus on strengthening infection patrol, uh, prevention and control, including hand hygiene with, with great results. Currently, there's a project running between Nottingham Trent University and McAvery um, University School of Public Health in Uganda, of course. And here the project was initiated as part of a wider program we're supporting, focused very much on antimicrobial stewardship. And that was in the WHO resolution, wasn't it, last year? Um, the importance of getting um, WASH correct in order for us to make more effective use and reduce the need for antimicrobials. So essential contributions. Um, many of these partnerships, I have to say, are supported by DFID, and I do want to praise the UK government for the support they're giving for this approach, and also to reference the very exciting partnership they've supported with uh, Unilever, which is the hand, Hygiene, Hand Washer and Behaviour Change Coalition, which I think is you know, a really important example of how we need to scale up our response at this time. But I, I conclude by really just joining with all of you and expressing my hope that our collective efforts will save lives and including those of health workers on the front line at this incredibly dangerous and um, challenging time. But also our collective hope that this will bring about real lasting improvement in the quality of healthcare. I really do congratulate everyone for this initiative um, and thank you for asking FET to contribute. Thank you very much, Ben, and clear articulation of investment in human partnerships and bringing together the workers at the front line. Um, without any further ado, let me go to James Wickham. Thank you very much, um, and good evening, everybody. Uh, time is short, so let me make uh, one commitment this evening and uh, one key point. Um, I'm I'm working with the Water Supply and Sanitation Collaborative Council, and at the moment we are um, in the process of evolving this into the Sanitation and Hygiene Fund that will provide catalytic funds to countries with the highest sanitation and hygiene burden and the least ability to respond. And one of the four strategic objectives of the new fund focuses on institutions, both schools and healthcare facilities. Um, therefore, in support of the resolution, I'm very pleased to commit far greater investment to this issue from our organization in the years ahead. The fund will support governments to deliver on their costed national plans or, or roadmaps as they're referred to in the resolution for addressing uh, washing healthcare facilities where these plans um, and where these plans don't exist, there will be investments to support their development along with other elements of the enabling environment referenced in the resolution, minimum standards, accountability mechanisms and the like. Um, in fact, similar to uh, Claire before, we've seen um, that in undertaking this transition, the COVID-19 response has actually given us a, a jump start into healthcare facility work with many of our implementing partners across existing countries now supporting a range of interventions, including protection of the health workforce uh, in these settings. Um, so that's a, that's a commitment that we can make today. The, the key point I'd like to make is around the investment case. Um, we believe that new investors in this fund uh, need to understand the return on investment and the impact they can expect from the dollars they invest. 
this is important as other funds approach replenishment from this perspective and have been quite successful and they have indeed set a, a benchmark that we aspire to. Um, and we are currently writing the first investment case for the Sanitation and Hygiene Fund. Um, and in doing that, the, uh, the area of uh, healthcare facilities is proving the more of the most challenging to gather robust data on unit costs and impacts. Um, so I've been very uh, pleased to see Sanjay mention that right at the start of this webinar and quite a rich discussion on the Slack channel of others who are also uh, in, endeavoring to pull together an investment case uh, in line with section 3.3 of the resolution. This is something that we, I'm sure with the energy in this group, we will collaborate on in the next, uh, in the next year to make the best investment case that we can to attract resources to this issue. Um, in essence, I think we need to know what it will cost to really deliver on the resolution in the years ahead. Um, Another, another powerful way, I think, to increase, increase investment is to make sure that their demand is strongly heard from governments to address the issue. Um, and listening to some of the WHA sessions earlier in this week, it was striking to hear how even during the pandemic, we were not hearing too many voices talking about uh, WASH from the health ministers. So we need to continue to use the collaborative platforms we have, including Sanitation and Water for All platform, um, to keep up the momentum behind this resolution. Um, so let me conclude by congratulating everyone involved in this collective action to secure the resolution last year and all the great work that's been presented today to move from commitment to action and to commit our organization to be a fully engaged partner on this agenda from today onwards. Thank you, Shams. Thank you, James, and very clear and specific um, focused area of investment. So over to you, Elizabeth. The machine. Oops. My apologies. Um, thank you, Shams. Uh, I've been now uh, go on to our next uh, panelist. So we have Dr. Anshu Bamashi um, here with us. Thank you very much, Anshu. Safe water, functioning hand washing facilities, latrines, and hygiene and cleaning practices are especially important for improving health outcomes linked to maternal, newborn, and child health. Let me repeat a few statistics you might have already heard. First, the overall wash attributable burden of deaths amongst children under five is 13%, mainly due to diarrhea and pneumonia. But it also contributes to the underlying causes of child mortality and morbidity, such as undernutrition through diarrhea and intestinal parasite infections. In 2018, 22% of children under five had stunted growth and 7% were at risk of wasting. Second, at the health facility level, lack of wash is a major factor contributing to low quality of care. More people die every year from unsafe care than lack of care. Between approximately five and a half and eight and a half million deaths are attributable to poor quality care each year in low and middle income countries. This can be partly attributed to the fact that globally, 42% of healthcare facilities lack hand hygiene facilities at point of care, and 40% do not have systems to segregate waste. This results in an estimated 15% of patients in low and middle income countries acquiring one or more infections during a hospital stay. And infections associated with unclean birth accounts for 26% of neonatal deaths and 11% of maternal mortality. Together, these account for more than 1 million deaths a year. Third, WASH services strengthen the resilience of healthcare systems to prevent disease outbreaks, allow effective responses to emergencies, and bring emergencies under control when they occur. Poor WASH in healthcare facilities deters patients, particularly pregnant women, from seeking care. Currently, as a result of COVID-19, we already experience a reduction in healthcare seeking 
in a number of countries with negative impact on the health of mothers and children, which will result in a decline in progress towards the SDGs. For this reason, WASH consists of one of the eight core standards required to deliver maternal care, uh, sorry, deliver quality care for maternal, newborn, and child health in facilities. The countries of the network for improving quality of care for maternal, newborn, and child health have prioritized and are periodically reporting on the WASH related indicators at the district and facility level. Ethiopia, Ghana, and Malawi have developed partnerships to improve WASH in health facilities as a critical intervention that will contribute to halving maternal and newborn mortality within five years and improve experience of care. Our goal that by 2030, every healthcare facility in every setting should have safely managed reliable water, sanitation, and hygiene facilities and practices that meet staff and patient needs is therefore an imperative and not achieving it will be unacceptable and will undermine the achievement of the SDGs for all, especially for women and children. Thank you very much um, uh, for ensure that recording and that message is very loud and clear uh, in terms of um, uh, the benefits to make the investment in WASH and the reduction that we look to see in terms of um, healthcare, um, uh, people are seeking healthcare services with WASH services availability. So thank you very much, Anshu. Um, if I can move on to our next uh, speaker is uh, Hanan Balki. Hanan, I'll leave the session for you. you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Very clearly. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. So again, I don't know whether the slides will be able to be posted, but I'll make my uh, message quite uh, focused because I think the speakers before me have really um, hit the, the nail on the head, if you will, on the really major important elements of IPC and WASH in saving lives and in providing quality care for patients everywhere. The AMR division, which I'm heading at WHO, is really having a much larger umbrella to address the issue of antimicrobial resistance in animal, human, environment, water. And I think WASH fits very well within our cross-cutting uh, partners throughout headquarters and throughout um, organizations and partners outside of the WHO. The aim of the AMR division is to enhance the multi-sectorial work that is extremely needed to ensure that we address the, um, the stimulants of emergence of resistance among pathogens and try to nip them in the bud, if you will. And um, as you can see in this slide, this is a bit modified from the, inter from the interagency consulting group that was concluded in 2019 and was uh, launched by the SG in, in Unga, New York in 2016. And it really does focus on the elements of WASH, including IPC, and it pushes for the member states to really adopt the global action plan and the national action plan for AMR. Now, within that national action plan, the issue of providing um, clean water and sanitation and hygiene is extremely important. Uh, the next slide, please. If we look at some of the uh, numbers, so I think that I only had two slides, but I wanted to focus here on how can we ensure that we're following the most important message, which is do no harm. When we know that three uh, billion people have no hand hygiene facilities at home and two out of five healthcare settings do not have hand hygiene points of care. Um, sometimes I feel like we might be blessed that microorganisms cannot be seen with the naked eye because the contamination of our hands, environment, and water with pathogens, whether they are resistant or susceptible, would be quite nauseating, if you will. And I think that um, the elements that I would want to focus on here is to echo what my colleagues have mentioned, that um, we really have to establish 
leadership and leadership in the WASH area, in IPC area, and uh, take this career as a very serious one. One of the elements that we're trying to, that we're embarking on, and this has already been uh, initiated uh, throughout the, uh, the headquarters between uh, AMR and the IPC hub, is finalizing the competencies of infection prevention control practitioners. Our next step is try to establish a uh, I don't want to call it a generic, but a more applicable curriculum for the IPC uh, uh, practitioner and a career path that countries can actually adopt and implement within their educational system. And we're trying to be creative in a way that it would um, attune to all of the different disciplines, be able to be inserted in existing curricula, and as well uh, able to stand alone. Um, would, uh, would have several modules that um, certain healthcare providers will require certain entities of an infection control education. The other thing that I would like to emphasize is, uh, apart from our work for AMR, is uh, to uh, urge countries to put the necessary resources for the multi-sectorial work and to also identify the clear code of conduct in performances that already exist and, if you will, brush off the dust that might exist on it in some countries and try to implement some of these guidelines that have been out there and create a true intervention uh, or implementation for change in the member states. And um, I think, um, again, by doing no harm, we have to work hard together. And WASH is, a, is an indispensable and a, quite an urgent uh, agenda for safe uh, care and quality care for patients. I'll stop here and thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Hannan. That's really excellent uh, 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 factoring on the, the multi-sectoral approach in terms of uh, the partnership that we really need to announce uh, to get this work uh, going forward. I think really, really important. Um, you mentioned around leadership and education, so you know, the pathway to actually collaborate, I think, is really, really critical um, as part of the investment case going forward. Thank you very much. If I can go to our final panelists on this, um, so, so can you just, um, you're on? Uh, yes. Over to you at the moment. Thank you very much. Great, thanks. Uh, if I could have my slide, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, so I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, I wanted to reflect on the political trajectory of, the, of this agenda, of the Washington Healthcare Facilities Agenda, and towards the end propose some, some areas to focus on as we move forward on our collective efforts to really get this issue prioritised. Um, I think that no one would disagree with me that over the last few years we've seen huge momentum behind efforts to increase access to clean water and um, sanitation and hygiene in healthcare facilities. And this is rightly so, because if we consider that only half of healthcare facilities in LDCs have access to clean water, it's a scandal. It's an issue that we, we need to urgently address. And I do want to labor this point that it is a scandal and we, we, we need to, to speak uh, truth to power and, and face the reality that we, are, that we are dealing with. It's also encouraging to see that over the last few years and given our collective efforts, we've, there's been progress, tangible progress made. And we've, uh, we've heard from countries in, in the previous panel, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Cambodia, just to name a few, that there is progress that, that is being made. At, at an international level, uh, momentum was at its peak last year. Um, Maria started the open the, the discussions pointing to that. So we all remember the UN Secretary General's fronting this call to action or the resolution adopted at the World Health Assembly only one year ago. Uh, many of us were present at that uh, moment where Dr. Ted Tedros again fronted this call to action, which was so compelling. Yet, yet, a year from that moment, we still find ourselves in a place where the visibility of this agenda hasn't really translated into the tangible progress and into the levels of investment that we need to tackle this candle, to realize the ambition that we all, we all share. More generally, I think that it's also worth uh, emphasizing that WASH continues to be one of the most off-track SDGs um, of, of, of the whole global framework and that at current levels of progress, people living in LDCs will 
get safely managed water in 2131. 2131, that's 100 years behind schedule. And now, as a world, and we confront uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, governments' individual and collective unpreparedness to effectively protect populations becomes even more evident, and the inequities of, of, of that are amplified. Um, we know that many of us in rich countries can rely on one of the many crucial measures to protect ourselves from, from this virus, which is hand washing, access to clean water and to soap. We know that many health workers in our countries can rely on hygiene to protect themselves, among many other things that they need to do to protect themselves. So it is something that here in, 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 in rich countries we take for granted. But surely the women who make up the bulk of the global health and social care workforce and that are significantly expo exposed to the virus, many of them in LDCs don't have this privilege. I was very um, encouraged and um, uh, to hear Haveris and Katia's um, uh, own experiences and stories of putting uh, uh, the, uh, the voices of these women in the, in the, at the center of the debate and at what trade we are committed to doing that. So what we are saying is a stark disconnect between momentum and visibility that many of us have been at the center of, of creating and, and helping, um, helping create, um, and a lack of ambitions in the current COVID response in terms of putting issues of access to clean water and hygiene at the absolute center of the response. So just to give you a few examples of, of why I'm saying this, um, water Aid has been working with many of you, with, with partners, trying to get WASH into the resolution that was passed um, earlier in the week, that was very, very hard work. We had to really mobilize all the resources, people, contacts that we had in order to get that done. And we've been working in coalition, so it hasn't been only an individual effort. Um, we hear from our own country teams in Africa, in Asia, in the Pacific, uh, that their own governments are not investing nearly enough to expand hygiene services for, for communities and healthcare facilities. On the donor side of things, we've, what rate has done uh, some analysis and what we've uh, concluded is that out of 53 announcements on the COVID response from, don from donors, only eight include some sort of reference to water and hygiene. So clearly the search for a vaccine is absolutely vital. Um, we don't have it yet. We don't know how long that's going to take. And we also need to invest in these frontline defenses in infection prevention and control. And this is where WASH is absolutely fundamental to that. We are encouraged by, by some exceptions, by, by some um, uh, signals of leadership. So Dr. Ted Ross' speech at the opening um, on Monday uh, very clearly mentioned the importance of hygiene and access to clean water as part of a package of measures to, tack it, to tackle COVID. That, that is something that we incredibly will be massively welcome. There's also a couple of other ex exceptions in terms of things that are happening. So for example, the UK government, DFED, is uh, working with Unilever and they have launched a global hand washing campaign. Incredibly good leadership from, from, from DFED. Uh, there's a basics consortium with Save the Children, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and Kinos. These two examples, the Unilever DFID and the Basics one, are two really good models of public private academic partnerships that both work to tackle the, the, the immediate COVID crisis as well as build the capacity of the systems to prevent a new health crisis from wreaking havoc in, in populations. So let me finish by saying where next? How do we accelerate this journey from resolution to revolution that we're all so committed to? From a water aid perspective, we think that there's two things that are uh, urgently needed. We need political champions, we need political commitment, political leadership, and we need investment to follow that. So there's three specific things that we'll be working towards over the next few months. And we'd love to partner with all of you on that. The first one is that in the context of the COVID-19 response, we want to make sure that those responses are strengthening the systems that will equip us with the ability to prevent future health crises from happening. Uh, this is about investing in the sustainable services, the services that are long-lasting, that will protect the most vulnerable especially.
The second point is that we need a very clear and compelling investment case, investment case for washing healthcare facilities. To mobilize political action, we need to be as tangible as we can in what is it that we are asking, um, what is the scale? What is the scale of the investment? What is the scale of the challenge that we need to address? And then finally, and a more general point, from an ODA perspective, international aid perspective, we believe that um, aid for WASH must be at least doubled, not only to uh, face the immediate COVID crisis, but also again to build the, the, the sustainability and the resilience of health and WASH systems to prevent the next pandemic from, from happening. I think that, that's all from, from me and thank you very much for, for your time. Thank you very much, Sol, for that very um, insightful uh, presentation and, and really highlighting the challenges and the reality on the ground as we take this work forward. I think really, really critical that we get the visibility of the political engagement um, to, to, and, with the, and also the donors to, to move this forward. Really critical we do that. So thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Um, I think that's the last uh, on our list of uh, panelists. Um, I want to just say thank you to all the panelists for the for this session. Really grateful for your for your contribution to the overall um, washed uh, session. Shams, do you want to say something before we hand back to uh, Maria? Just to say, it's been a fantastic array of uh, individuals that have been able to provide input on how investments can take place at country level, at um, the level of worker to worker solidarity, institutional health partnerships a specific focus area on menstrual hygiene, a population group, of course, maternal and newborn child health, specific high priority areas for antimicrobial resistance, and then, of course, the, um, the real uh, focus on uh, WASH as a best buy in public health that Stuart just brought forward just, just now. So a, a great range of in, in, inputs that we will all need to consider very carefully. So back to you, Maria. Thank you all. Just to say that we are so late, almost 40 minutes, but everybody is still connected, which proves that this is a very interesting topic. So my pleasure now to pass uh, to my colleague, Dr. Naoko Yamamoto, our Assistant Director General, for the closing remarks. And then thank you all for, for being so patient and staying with us even over time. Thank you, and, and obviously for the great presentations. Now over to you, please. Thank you, Maria. Let me say short. And, and uh, uh, show our appreciation. Thank you very much for all audience or uh, speakers, panelists to join. And uh, uh, we are honored to host this um, webinar with uh, UNICEF and together with uh, a lot of sponsors. Thank you again, all of you to stay a little bit longer than we planned. But this is for me is like a testimony how WASH is fundamentally important for all of us and how we are we passionate to achieve access, universal access for WASH. So uh, from WHO, we have uh, almost all program uh, representatives mentioned, uh, join. Uh, WHE, emergency group, environment, UH universal health coverage, MR, all of them. It means WASH is our infrastructure, crucial infrastructure for all health programs. And moreover, from we have uh, we heard from the many partners and organizations. Uh, WASH is uh, for the lives of the people, well-being, uh, quality of life, or human rights issues or dignity issues. We discussed a lot. The, the most importantly, we heard a lot from the country experiences and we learned a lot how we can achieve and how we can improve the, the, the WASH. WASH. So, um, we are in now, so we are still in a, like a painful stage in the experience for the COVID-19 for all of us. But uh, let us to use this COVID-19 to the opportunity, make this uh, COVID-19 to our opportunity to for the for, to address the wash issues and accelerate the wash. So, uh, thank you again, and uh, we definitely as WHO will work uh, ready to stand up and also continue to stand up to work together with you to achieve universal wash. Thank you very much, over.
I think that somebody need to say something or like Marianela is jumping. Again, thank you all very, very much. And then finish of our webinar, 40 minutes late. Thank you, it was amazing. I hope you think the same and now get back to work. <laughs> Bye to all of you and thank you for the to the organizers, Maggie Montgomery, UNICEF, WHO, and of course our friends from WaterAid and others. Thank you very much and bye. Thank you very much for the opportunity to participate. I've very much enjoyed the side event. Wish you all luck. Bye-bye. <laughs>